Welcome to the second annual Dead Last, Dead Last, in which we take all the movies of the past year that got voted Dead Last and rank them, nailing down the worst movie of the year. Uh, last year, the honor of DLDL went to the cinematic slog Slender Man, directed by Sylvain White, who coincidentally also directed one of this year's entries. And let's take a look at the movies that graced the bottoms of our lists. Now, the gamut of films that we talked about this year went from rosters of genuine quality to the bottom of the barrel, and I asked for rankings. But the finale here is a little different than normal since I didn't just ask my patrons, but I asked all of you out there in YouTube land to watch them and rank them, and 80 people answered the call. And here's who sent me their lists. Now, normally, we kick off with our worst entry and count down to the best movie. But this is a bit different since we're going to start with the best performing flick and head down all the way to the dead last, dead last. Here with me today, uh, I have a whole bunch of patrons who will be popping in to discuss their rankings and my special guest, someone I'm honored to have here to cap off these terrible films, especially since he's recently forced me to watch some terrible movies. So here I got to return the favor and it's our good friend, Dustin Ferguson. It is great to have you on, Dustin. The pleasure is all mine. Thanks for having me back. Now, we have you to talk about all these movies, but I want to point out that we've never had one of your movies on Dead Last. So it's only a matter of time. Okay, so with 80 entrants, that means that the best score that a movie could achieve is 80 points. If every single person ranked a movie number one for one point each, it could get 80 here. But if every single person ranked one dead last, the lowest possible score that it could achieve would be 720 points. So here we go. Starting with the movie that got the least amount of votes and coming in at number one here with a mere 255 points was Interview with the Vampire. It was ranked dead last 11 times, and curiously, even though it is number one, it got the second highest number of dead last votes. So the people who didn't like it really didn't like it, but the people who did really did, because it got 37 number one votes, by far the largest amount there. Now, I ranked this movie in my top spot, and I was a bit torn, because clearly it, it's the best movie on this list. It, and the only reason that it's even on a list of dead last movies is because the episode it was featured on had a whole group of amazing movies on it. And this was simply the least amazing one. I mean, you can't deny that this is a well-made movie. It's top-notch production values. It makes good use of its healthy budget. I, I mean, but I have to say though, that it's not exactly the movie that I would enjoy the most watching here because it's not something that I would just throw on and enjoy for for the hell of it. But I can absolutely admire the artistry that went into it and felt it had to be acknowledged. Um, now, Dustin, you also had it pretty high up. You gave it your number two spot. Well, just, I guess that despite its flaws, it's still regarded as kind of a classic, you know, by most people. They, everybody's seen it. Everybody's heard of it. It, like I just said, had the biggest budget. It was the most polished probably out of all the movies. So I suppose it earns a spot in like one or two just for those reasons, even if you don't really like the movie. Uh, well, someone who didn't feel the need to give it a one or two is a, one of my patrons, and this is his very first appearance on the show, and I would like to welcome AJ to the show. Hello. AJ, although it's not in your first two places, you still enjoyed this and gave it your number three spot. You know, in the vampire list was a, move, a list of just all good movies. It was like, you know, I didn't feel bad that Interview with a Vampire was dead last, even though it wasn't my personal dead last. Mm. You know, like I understood, like, you know, any movie was going to, you know, end up in that position. And honestly, I, I like Interview with a Vampire in a much different way than I like a lot of vampire films, because, you know, quite honestly, it's like not really as fun as a lot of vampire films that we get, you know. But it's a meaningful film in a lot of ways. Ultimately, my assessment would kind of be like, it's a very tragic, sad tale that, <laughs> that kind of loses its footing at the end that the people who had maybe fantasized about wanting to like, oh, be a vampire, the romantic side of that or whatever, maybe could watch that film and be like, that actually does not sound great. 
I would definitely recommend it for people who are vampire fans. But if somebody's like not particularly into that genre, I would say skip it. Okay, that'll take us up to our number two film with a decent jump in points. At 296 points is John Carpenter's Ghost of Mars, which only got the dead last spot twice and did get ranked number one 13 times. I actually had this pretty high myself because I did put it at number two, which is where it ended up. Uh, and I put this uh, one up here because although I do think that it is a pretty crappy movie, I still think it's a pretty fun time. It, it's this like weird Western parody that just never really works, but at least it's giving some weird moments of entertainment in there. And it, you, could, you could pop this on and while you're not really satisfied, you're at least occupied. Uh, plus, I would feel weird giving any sort of lower rank to something by Carpenter. But uh, Dustin, you did give it a touch lower ranking because you've got it at number four. Yeah, I mean, I don't know why anybody's ranking that one very high, other than John Carpenter. It had good pacing, you know, had some good action sequences. It was shot well. It was like a step up from Escape from L.A., but I don't know. It's one of those movies that, like, it come, like you see it on video on a Sunday afternoon, and it's just kind of boring. And that's about it. You know, as an Escape from L.A. fan, I feel a little attacked, a little attacked right now. But, uh, but you know, someone who liked this film a little bit less than us is one of my patrons. And she's returning to the show after being on a full episode and a couple of jams. And it's Spooky Heather. Uh, so now you've got this a bit lower. You've placed it in seventh. So John Carpenter really should have known a lot better. <laughs> he, he, John Carpenter should have done better. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's the, the movie looks cheap. He had, I mean, Dark Star looked cheap because he had like fifty thousand, sixty thousand dollars. He had twenty eight million Jesus. for this, and and the studio and the whole studio. Everybody was like, "Yay, make this movie!" And it was just, I mean, aside from there's a whole like dis, which there's a whole distasteful angle of it where it's like as with a Western, which is what he was trying to make, but a pre-60s Western, it's like, yay, colonists are heroes. Boo, the natives are savage. Let's do some genocide. <laughs> but could you really describe one character, what their traits are, what they do? It's Nobody is memorable. Everybody's just kind of boring and disposable. So you have basically a pre-Western, pre-60s Western, salt on precincts, uh, 13 meets Escape from New York without anything interesting of those movies. Moving on now to our number three movie, which had a pretty big increase in points now because coming in with 368 points is Honeymoon. And you know, it was only ranked dead last once. Officially the film on the list to get ranked dead last the least here, but it was ranked number one four times. My ranking for this one once again matches where it landed because I have it as my number three and it's another one that I, I don't mind. It, it doesn't really offer much new, but at least it manages to build up a solid bit of atmosphere while doing it, even though it's ultimately fairly dull. It, it does serve up some good suspense here and there. It, its biggest downfall is that it's pretty forgettable, but I'll, I'll admit that this isn't the kind of forgettable that gets under my skin. Like I didn't forget what was happening while I was watching it, which is why I put it a few notches higher than some of the other ones on here. But that being said, I think someone that doesn't feel the same way as me is you, Dustin. Uh, you've got this ranked much lower as your number eight. So you had some disdain for this one. I wouldn't call it disdain. I guess it was just pretentious. Mm -hmm. You know, between him and her, like their, their whole dynamic and how it re reminded me in a lot of ways of the Fog remake where he's just like running around yelling his girlfriend's name through the whole movie. Like, it, I, don't know, I just didn't really like it. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, it had a good story, you know, like with her disappearing and coming back. It kind of was like Invasion of the Body Snatchers vibes, I suppose, but I just didn't really like the direction of the film. Well, I think someone who did like the direction is someone who you've seen a few times before on a couple of episodes and the jams, and it's Sarah. Welcome back. Hi, Josh. Thanks for having me back. You also have this one in third place. 
clearly, uh, there has been much discussion about Honeymoon between when it was first introduced to Dead Last and I clearly have a softer spot for it than other people. And I think that's because it plays for me like a long form Outer Limits episode. Uh, it's got a happy-ish beginning and slowly things just devolve into absolute chaos and destruction. And it does it very prettily. It appears to be a metaphor for when you're in a long-term relationship and suddenly you no longer know the person that you're with. And as the relationship devolves, the it, one person is trying to figure out what is going on, what happened to the person that I loved, where did they go? And the other person is just kind of giving you these half-baked things of, no, I'm, I'm here. And I really like it. I, I think it's it's a pretty movie. It It's a interesting movie. And I think it has something to say. Well, as we advance down the list here, it gets a little bit more heated because there was only one point, one point between Honeymoon and our number four movie, which finished with 369 points. And it was the Child's Play remake from 2019. It was ranked dead last five times but it was also ranked number one five times. So I had this a touch lower than the ranking because I had this at number five myself, but uh, this is at the point in the list in which I generally don't really care for the movies. And, and I know that some people enjoy this one, but I'm not really, not, not really a fan. I had it as my dead last on the Chucky list, and I think it deserves to be here because I, I have to say that although I'm not a remake hater, I mean, I'm fine with remakes, they don't piss me off in general, and I'm willing to give them their fair shake. I, I like when a remake tries to switch things up and give me something a little bit different, but here's, here's the thing. If you're going to make changes to a formula, they should be improvements and not making it worse. And this movie decided to say, oh, hey, we're not supernatural. We're doing AI because we're going for a more grounded approach. And then you give me dolls that magically connect to Wi-Fi like anywhere. Um, in seat belts and I guess have the strength of a human being and it just it just didn't work for me like at all now Dustin you seem to have mostly felt the same way because like me you have this in fifth I thought it was really unnecessary you know what I mean like especially now that there's other ones it was like it was kind of just the worst one of them Okay, so it had the same problem that I have with the Halloween remake by Rob Zombie where they tried to like ground it in reality where like it was a, a worker that was pissed off and, you know, had done that with like tampered with the dolls. Mm -hmm. And I think that the scary aspect of like the evil spirit is what makes the original, even though it's less believable, I mean, more of a classic and just like Michael Myers hearing voices in his head to kill people is just creepier. And the fact that he's unkillable boogeyman versus just some white trash kid that grew up in a bad home <laughs> and i think that because that's what they were trying to do it's like oh yeah because technology is so crazy now and look at all the possibilities but this is going to look really dated and cheesy in like 20 years it already is it's yeah. just like mm -hmm. and now someone who actually had a slightly different opinion than us uh returning to the show after recently appearing on an episode and the previous jams welcome back shannon Hey, Josh, thanks for having me back. Looking forward to talking about some bad movies again. Uh, speaking of bad movies, you gave this one a bit lower than us because you had it in seventh. Yeah, it was one of those. I think whenever a movie like has is a remake, re-envisioning, whatever you want to call it, reboot, it has a lot to overcome. And this movie just didn't do it. Like it actually, when I we had to go back into this list, I had to re-watch the movie, even though I saw it not too long ago to do the Child's Play Dead Last rankings because literally the only thing I remember from it was the head sitting on the desk. I appreciate the fact that they took the whole technology aspect and you know what, how reliant are we on technology and um, kind of went that way of what, what if, but it wasn't a Chucky movie. Like it took the heart of what the franchise was and totally gutted it. I almost wondered like, did anyone who made this movie ever watch any of the other child's plays so it just like totally lost the spirit of what child's play was and 
again, just wasn't memorable. Like I can tell you the first, the original Child's Play, everything that happened. And in this one, I had to rewatch it, even though I'd watched it like six months ago or less. So, Rounding up the top part of our list now, at number five with 387 points is actually our second remake on this list. And it's the Pet Cemetery remake, also from 2019. It actually landed dead last five times, but it did get ranked number one three times. And I guess I should point out here that every movie on the list got dead last at least once. I had this one a touch lower though, since I put it at number seven. And I remember when I said that Honeymoon is the kind of forgettable that doesn't get under my skin? Well, here's an example of one that does. Uh, the funny thing is that I think the original Pet Cemetery is the type of movie that I personally want to see remade. I thought it was enjoyable, but that there was room for improvement in it. The book has a lot more going on and it's denser and has more lore and this almost Lovecraftian feeling of something sinister creeping around the edges of everything. But they went the opposite way here because this movie's even more surface level than the older version. Everything's flat and lacks any ounce of atmosphere, which is crazy because in their previous movie, Starry Eyes, all of that was on hand. So I, I just don't understand what went wrong here and why any of that was absent, leaving a pretty frustrating disposable movie. I didn't like this, the switch with it being the daughter sort of, you know, gauge. Um, I thought that was lame. And I didn't like having, again, it was kind of like the pretentious filmmaking aspect of it with like the shot of the kids banging the drums and the instruments wearing the mask right at the beginning of the movie like ooh, it's so scary there's this like kid cult or something like it was really over the top and dumb you know i think that any the movies that you just like with child's play it's like you're supposed to be remaking the movies that were bad initially not the ones that were good initially because you're going to inherently compare it to the original and i think that the original Pet Cemetery is like solid, scary, suspenseful movie. You know, it's classic. It builds mood. It has atmosphere. And I think all of that stuff's lacking, especially from like the 2009 era of remakes. Because that was like the end of the remake boom when they were just kind of running out of movies to remake. So now it's like Child's Play and Pet Cemetery. <laughs> Well, for a slightly rosier perspective on this one, let's actually go to a person who you've seen on the previous Jam episodes, but you can also check out here on YouTube at Hill House Productions, and it is Ryan. It's good to have you back. Nice to be back. It's been a while. Now, you've got this a bit higher than us, and it's your number four. I think part of the reason I like this movie so much is because I watched it for the first time shortly after I watched the original for the second time and it was just that much better by comparison. When you're, re when you're reading a book, it's okay if you have something happen and then there's a couple chapters of setup and then something else happens. But when I'm watching a movie, that shouldn't happen. And both of these movies do that, but the new one does it less. I like some of the changes they made. Unfortunately, some of those changes were spoiled in the trailers, but not all of them. With the exception of John Lithgow, I think each actor here did a better job of portraying their character than the actors in the original. I mean, John Lithgow is still good, but he's no Fred Gwynn. Getting closer to the bottom now, we move on to our number six movie, which was still pretty close to the couple preceding it, because like I said, this whole middle portion got really close. And with 397 points, it's 2017's Leatherface. This one was ranked dead last twice, but was actually ranked first four times as well. I didn't have as rosy of a perspective on this one though, because I gave it eighth place because I just find this one really hard to get through. I mean, I don't need my movie characters to be perfect angels on it or anything, but if you're gonna want me to be engrossed in your movie, you have to give me at least one person that I don't completely hate. I'm not sure where this whole new style of dialogue in which you have people who just constantly argue like they're on a reality show vying for screen time by being the most grating character or whatever, but I can't wait for it to change. I've said before that bad movies can either be enjoyably bad, boring bad, or frustrating bad, and this film falls firmly into the third category for me. 
Now, Dustin, you share my sentiment because this one was your dead last. <sighs> There's just so much to not like about it. From like the opening scene, um, finding the animal on the side of the road, it was just very contrived. And the whole bait and switch with who Leatherface was, was like, I think really aggravating for just about everybody that watched the movie. Because especially in the early trailers for the movie, they really make it portrayed that this certain character is obviously Leatherface. Yeah. And then at the end, they're like, oh no, it's this other guy. Here's <laughs> why. He has a scar on his face. Like, it was so dumb and so unlikable and so unnecessary. And clearly they just threw it right away because they came out with another one right after that. Someone who has a similar feeling, but maybe not quite as lowly ranked, is another familiar face. He's been on a previous episode as well as The Jams, and it's our good friend, Tom. Thanks. Uh, always fun to be here. You've actually got this one pretty low, but a little higher than us, since you've got it in seventh. Yeah. Now, almost every Texas Chainsaw Massacre movie is a reboot. So I guess that isn't what bothers me too much with that one, but it feels like a fundamental betrayal of the Leatherface character. None of it ever feels like it's part of the franchise because for one thing, it's basically kind of this prison break, you know, type film where they're on the run from the cops. It just doesn't feel at all like it belongs in the the franchise they do these weird weird little gross things that are supposed to gross you out that feel kind of pointless but this movie just feels like did you watch the other films <laughs> do you know what a texas chainsaw massacre film is because it ain't that it, it it is not leatherface well, now we're ramping it up as we head into the bottom three here, and we're getting worse because with 465 points, which is a pretty pretty big jump there, we have a movie from the director of Last Year's Dead, Last Dead, Last, and it's I'll Always Know What You Did Last Summer. And this got a lot of low scores, but still only got dead last five times and did sneak in four number one rankings as well. So I don't exactly have a, a, that low of a ranking here as others because I have it in six. It's not one that I enjoy watching because the entirety of the first hour plus is just pretty dull and by the numbers, there's just nothing to differentiate it between itself and like 100 other movies from the same era. It's kind of bloodless and unexciting slasher mystery flick that just feels like a movie being made by focus groups more than anything else. Uh, like audiences like this kind of scene put put that in there but it all just seems like very robotic but i did put it a bit higher than some of the other dull ones on this list because i think that the twist at the ending is so out of the blue and wacky that it livened things up for me i wish that the whole movie was zombie ghost ben give me that for 90 minutes it, it would have made it stand out more and possibly made for a more worthwhile time. And I'll also call out that White was a last minute replacement and had only two weeks to get everything prepped for shooting. So I'm, I'm gonna cut him a little slack. That being said, we've got some different opinions here because Dustin, you had this as your number one. Your number one. Yeah, it's awesome. What is, why does everybody hate this movie? Like, okay, so, the first two I thought were terrible. Anyways, they're like PG-13 fluff that was copying the screen trend at the time. It was really, like the first one's a well-made movie. I guess it's a classic from the era. The second one was so pointless. And what I loved about the third one is it was like a hard R slasher movie set in like a kind of isolated atmospheric setting with some cool kill scenes. It was totally original and unpredictable. And don't get me wrong. It's not like I'm saying it's a great film. It was just on this list. It's like the least worst. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, now, here's someone to counter that, and he's a familiar face to the channel, and he's got his own channel with the same name and his hit series, Nails in the Coffin, and it is your friendly neighborhood, Uncle Pete. Thanks, Josh. Thanks for having me back. I even wore the Dead Last shirt. Well, this one was a bust for you because you've put it in eighth place. It made no sense. You have a killer fisherman in a landlocked 
town, but the killer is a fisherman who has no connection to these kids. And the only connection between the first two movies is a newspaper article saying four teens killed in the Bahamas. But that didn't happen. And I still know what you did last summer because people survived. Unless they're saying they died after the movie. They try to be cool and edgy with quick cuts and quick zooms and flashes with edgy late 90s, early 2000s music. And I don't know what they tried to do. It was like a, a boring music video. And I just couldn't get into it. And the, the cliche fisherman at the end was just, it was dumb. I couldn't get into the movie. It, the kills weren't that interesting to me. And like I said, it was just boring. It didn't make any sense. And I just, I never want to have to watch this movie again. I'll always not want to watch. I'll always know what you did last summer again. But you know what? I have one more opinion on this movie. And for that, we're going to go back up north of the border with someone else who's appeared on the previous Jam episodes. And it's Mike. Hey, Josh. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me back. It's, uh, it's been a while. It's been, been a long time. So you have a little higher ranking here showing the wide range of feelings that people had on this. You had it in fourth, so you gave it a little better score. Yeah, it did. It did, actually. Um, I don't like it. Um, it is on this list of pretty um, forgettable films, but um, it, it did get uh, higher on the list than, um, than quite a few of the others, for sure. Thing is, I've never been really, um, uh, I know what you did last summer, fan. The original was decent. Um, I didn't go nuts over it uh the sequel as bad and, and and plausible as it is it was fun at least this one not fun at all it i just i couldn't get over the amateurish look and feel of the, of the movie yeah it just it just drags and clunks along to a very forgettable terrible ending and yeah uh, i didn't care for this one but it's not as bad as some of the others on this uh, on this list we're down to the wire now, the final two. And I have to tell you, I'm extremely sad about what I'm about to say. Because at 479 points, the second worst movie on this list is Santa Claus. It was actually ranked dead last seven times. But you know what? It was ranked number one five times, which is that's pretty respectable. And look, here's the thing. I had this movie as my number four, and I actually kind of enjoy watching it. I recognize that it's not good. It's really far from good. And yes, it's from John Russo, so there should be some sort of expectation. But here's my defense. You take this movie, and you take its budget, and all the things that went into making it, and you quadruple it, and you still don't have what any other film on this list was equipped with. IMDb says that this cost $40,000, and I think that's generous. Every other film on this list, with the possible exception of I'll Always Know, cost over a million dollars. Hell, Interview cost over 60 million, and what? This is supposed to compete with that? And you know what? I'll say it. I probably get as much enjoyment from watching Santa Claus as I do from Interview. It's a different type of enjoyment altogether, but it is equal nonetheless. You know who agrees with me, Dustin, because you gave this third place. I mean, it's got the like direct to video 90s vibe and I love those movies. It's got really good humor. I can appreciate, you know, that they're just like having fun with the production. You can tell, you know, like those movies always resonate with me, like the camp value of it. And for John Russo, it's one of his best movies. Like Midnight is my favorite, like one of my all-time favorite horror movies actually. But I think that he did a lot of duds later. And I think that this was one of those ones where like he embraced the campy, low budget nature of it and it just really worked. And you know what? There's no shortage of love for this movie because we're gonna go now to someone who helped us talk about the Scream movies and appeared on the jams. And it's Steven. You may have even enjoyed this more than us because you gave it second place. True, a true masterpiece for our times. <laughs> I like weird trash and it's not just weird, but it's, you know, it's weird in a very specific way. And then like the film is so bloodless, but it's, it's not just like, they didn't just go to the trouble of having like no blood. There's they, you know, they drop little, little drops of blood on the women's corpses. And it's like, what, what is going on here? Like, I don't, 
I don't understand it. Do they not have like a corn syrup budget? I mean, if, if you couldn't make wounds, at least like, you know, just pour some fake blood all over the place. So it looked like, you know, the killing was brutal. Like what did the killer do? Did he just kind of tap it? And then the fact that it's directed by John Russo, who co-wrote, you know, one of the greatest horror films ever made and has the weird songs and just like, how, how did this happen? What, what was the process that led to this movie coming into existence? All right, now, okay, this movie is ranked eighth out of nine, and I feel bad that we've only had people talk about how much that they enjoy it. So let's check with another familiar face. He helped us rank all of the Carpenter films, and it's Dan, and it's good to see you, Dan. Thank you, Josh, how are you? I was doing great until I saw Santa Claus ranked in eighth place, but you, you kind of agree because you did not care so much for this one, and you ranked it pretty low in uh, seventh place. I didn't love it. I mean, um, I, I can't say I hated everything about it, but I, I think I watch a movie like this and I'm like, well, it fits into a rich tradition of kind of bad looking 80s horror, low budget, you know, and sometimes I can get into that area, but then I'm like, but this is 1996 and John A. Russo wrote this? What happened here? At least give me some like really good kills. I mean, a lot of the a lot of the kills are sort of done in a way where you don't even really see what's happening, and I don't need that per se. But a lot of times in cheap R movies, that's that's sort of your stock and trade is sort of the gore or something, and I feel like it's it's missing even on that, which is almost like the bare minimum expectation of cheap horror. It's pretty rudimentary uh, filmmaking, and again, that's where I scratch my head. Like I know I know Russo didn't direct a lot of movies, but it, you know by this point he's been in the business for so long. He at least would have some people being like, John, this, this isn't how you do it, buddy. Um, so yeah, didn't love it. Uh, don't hate it, but I don't hate most movies. Well, hey, speaking of hating movies, we have reached the end of the road. Out of all the movies that we've featured this year, these movies were ranked dead last of them. And out of these movies, only one could be considered the dead last of the dead lasts. And this year's crown goes with a whopping 584 points to Human Centipede 3. First off, I want to say that it was ranked first place five times, to which I say, I mean, hey, whatever floats your boat, guys, but was this really your favorite film on this list? Were you being honest with that ranking? But more importantly, it was ranked dead last 45 times, 45 times out of 80, it got that final spot. And you know what? I was one of the 45 because I hate this movie. I, and here's the thing, people won't watch this one because of the whole, oh my God, it's so gross factor that the first two had just based on the concept. But in this one, it's barely even a thing. No, here you're not getting disgusted by a human being's mouth being stitched to another one's anus. Here you're getting pushed to the brink by a sweaty bald German guy flicking his tongue and screaming at the top of his lungs directly at you for 90 straight minutes. I mean the thing is I can take the first two. I mean they're not my cup of tea and they're just purposely gross for the sake of it, but they don't make me want to gouge my eyes out with rusty Santokus. And, but did you know what did? H Human Centipede 3. Dustin, you didn't quite give this dead last though. You gave it seventh, so you saw some redeeming qualities. It had the artistic merit, which I think I mentioned to you in email. It was just like, I mean, you know, it was well made, it was well shot. I thought the meta aspect of it kind of being about the first two movies was cool because it was before everybody was doing that. Hmm. And how like, oh yeah, no, it's truly medically possible. So let's do it. It's like, it was pretty absurd. It, it reminded me of, in tone of a Serbian film where it's like, it's really, really well made, but the stuff that you're seeing is really hard to watch. And I, this is the only one I actually didn't get all the way through and I told you that because it was just sort of like, I get the point. <laughs> like, I think maybe it wasn't as graphic as the second film, but it was more disturbing. Well, here's someone who didn't see those redeeming bits and you may have seen him on the Jam episodes or possibly on his great channel right here on YouTube, the horror movie syllabus, and it's Professor Victor. 
Thank you, Josh. Thank you for having me again. I uh, really appreciate being back on the show. And you ranked this one dead last. I did. Human Centipede 3. And let me start by just pointing out that I actually liked the first two Human Centipede movies. So it's not that I have a problem with the story or the concept fundamentally. I have a problem with Human Centipede 3. But what I did try to do in the interest of, in the interest of science is I tried watching YouTube videos of people who do like this movie to try to get an idea of what it is about this movie that people enjoy. And the theme that seems to be prevalent amongst that is uh, people who, who appreciate morbid or inappropriate humor. That seems to be the thing. Like if you can appreciate uh, a dark sense of humor, then, then you can like this movie. But I think I have a morbid, inappropriate sense of humor, and I don't think this movie's funny uh, because I feel like it's too much of the same joke over and over again. It's it's basically beating a dead horse, or if you're Tom Six, it's like beating off on a dead horse. It's just trying to be gross for the sake of being gross, but being gross in the same way. This movie fails in being a comedy. It fails in being gross. It fails at being scary. It just, it fails at being entertaining. Okay, and last, but certainly not least, for one final opinion on our bona fide dead last, dead last, we go now to someone who's appeared a few times now on two episodes, and it is Sable. Welcome back. <laughs> Hi, Josh. That seems appropriate for what you're here for, and that's to talk about a movie that you also had in your dead last spot. So how do you feel about Human Centipede 3? All right, let's discuss this. So I don't know who handed somebody some sort of demonic tome worth of money to make this pile of actual waste. I can't say trash because I love trash. I love trash movies. Trash movies are my bread and butter. Fuck this movie. Like fuck it in its fucking face. How the fuck dare you make this? And you know, I know that this society looks down on sex workers on many cases. And I think that's wrong in every way because they at least provide a service. But we always say that the lowest form of something is somebody pouring themselves out. I put it to you this, it is somebody Eric Robertsing themselves because Eric Roberts will do literally anything for money. And this movie proves that because if nothing else, this exists. I, I swear to God, if I were on the crew, I would pray for the return of celluloid just to burn all the film and everyone in it. <laughs> all right. So there you have it. Uh, there's the roster. Nine movies from the best all the way down to the dead last of the dead lasts. Uh, let's take a look at our roster here. And I'm I'm fairly happy with this, except for Santa Claus at number eight. I'm pretty... I'm, Pretty bummed out about that, actually. But but you guys voted, and your voices were heard. If you have a strong disagreement about where anything landed, I want to hear about it. Although I kind of don't, because you, you had your chance to send in your rankings. So, you know, wh wh where were you a couple of weeks ago, right? Um, but comment if you were happy or unhappy with the results, and maybe which of these movies y you don't think belonged here in the first place. And, and also, uh, as always, hit that... Hit that like button if you enjoyed the content, and subscribe if you can. And I want to thank all of my patrons, those who appeared today, uh, those who just voted, and those who just helped by contributing, which you can also do at patreon.com slash movie timelines. And most importantly, I want to thank my very special guest, Dustin Ferguson, for coming on here and helping to rank these movies. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. Uh, well, you gave me an excuse to watch some great bad stuff. And you guys out there should go check out Dustin's store. The link will be in the uh, description below and pick up some of his movies. And, and you've, you've got something cooking right now, right? Um, okay, so I'm actually about to go into production on Beyond the Gates of Hell and Liza Warden from Hell. It's a Grindhouse double feature. And so we're shooting those in June and they'll be out in August. 
We will be on the lookout for those, and thanks again for coming here today. And viewers, I want to thank you for watching and for voting, and we'll see you very soon for the launch of Season 3 of the newly revamped Dead Last, coming in one month, so stay tuned.